So, welcome to numerical methods. Yeah, we say to some extent finished our section on the mere Muden option valuation last time. So the Muden option valuation, the core part was the estimation of the conditional expectation operator because we needed this conditional expectation operator to, yeah, determine the exercise strategy, so when to exercise in the underlying, which then gives us uh, a stochastic time, you know, the exercise time. So at every sample path, there's a different time, a stochastic time. This stochastic time, we will see this today again, is a stopping time, the set stochastic time less or equal a given time you know, is measurable with respect to the filtration of that given time. So you know when you when you have st uh, should have stopped. And if you have this stopping time, the optimal exercise uh, time, the optimal exercise strategy, you can express the Bermudan option as an unconditional expectation. So all boils down to finding this exercise strategy. And if our estimate for the conditional expectation is, yeah, just an approximation, we make some mistakes. So our stopping time is maybe not optimal if it is still a stopping time. So if there is no foresight that we can see into the future, this leads to the uh, effect that our valuation is a lower bound. Yeah? So the Bermudan option tries to maximize the profit, tries to find the optimal exercise strategy and our suboptimal exercise strategy it you know, doesn't achieve this in full, you know, so we get a little bit less out of the financial product. So the value that we obtain is a lower bound. The interesting thing is that we can also derive an upper bound method. So this is a dual method. And the really funny thing is that inside this method is also the estimation of the conditional expectation but you now make the mistake maybe in the other direction. And yeah, why is it uh, important to have this dual method? Maybe just recall that in the end of our last session, I have this yeah nice uh, numerical experiment here. So we had this Bermudan option experiment where we valued a simple Bermudan option with different means of estimating the conditional expectation. We used our regression method with polynomials. Yeah? One degree, just a constant, yeah? or, or the zero. Uh, two basis functions, the linear function, yeah? and so on. Or we estimated the conditional expectation using binning, which, which is also just a regression using indicator functions as basis functions. And yeah, we could run this little program and he will print now for the different choices of basis functions uh, also the exercise probabilities yeah, at what time you exercise which with which probability and yeah if you look at the values that we obtain yeah you see that taking more basis functions is maybe not always a good idea because it will decrease it will decrease the value of the option yeah so for the binning actually it looked a little bit as taking more is always good but also recall that the monte carlo error increases because each bin yeah gets um, less sample path and it also appears as if there is some foresight bias yeah picked up yeah? because in the limit case where you have as many bins as you have sample pass every bin gets just a single sample pass this is perfect foresight so you see it's not really clear uh, what is the good choice for the basis functions and also if you look at these examples here plotted okay the program generates these plots. So what we would like to do is to estimate the green line with the blue line. The blue line is my estimate for the conditional expectation. But for the optimal exercise problem, it's actually more important to get this point right. Yeah? So 
the decision when to exercise. In, th in that case, actually just a constant is not such a bad thing, but uh, that uh, is not uh, yeah, generally the case. Yeah, This is just by coincidence. In a linear function, you see you don't get this point, right? Yeah, but okay, it's maybe still okay. Yeah, the error was not so big. A quadratic function is already, a quadratic function, yeah, looks already very good. If you now go to higher order uh, polynomials, oh, actually, that's not a quadratic, that's uh, a cubic one, yeah, it's four basis functions. So cubic one looks already quite good. Yeah, you also see that the, it, it is going a little bit back here. Yeah, it's bending a bit back. Huh? Sure. Okay, so this guy is maybe quite good. But if you now increase the number of basis functions yeah, to n equals five or n equals 10, yeah, you have an overfitting and you get maybe poor results. Yeah, Similar for binning, Okay, maybe that's quite okay. Yes, you make some mistakes here in, in this region here. Uh, but if you take more bins, yeah, you will pick up more noise. And by that noise, you, know, you see there's more noise here. By that noise, you have these fossa bias. Okay, so that as a motivation, if we take a small number of basis functions, we can maybe be sure that we don't pick up too much foresight bias, that our result is likely, so apart from Monte Carlo errors, likely a lower bound. And to be a little bit sure by how much we miss the optimal value, it would be nice to have an upper bound method. So the ansatz to evaluate the Bermudan option so far was giving by estimating the exercise strategy as a stopping time. And if this estimate is itself a stopping time, so if there is no foresight bias present, then the evaluation is giving me a lower bound for the true value. So the stopping time maximizes the optimal the option price, and you know, we have a different stopping time. Um, or the option price is actually the maximum of all possible stopping time times, and we just pick one. Yeah, so we have a lower bound. So what we now have is that we like to have a corresponding upper bound. So our upper bound method yeah, also converges to the true option price. Yeah, if we yeah, find actually the right thing, the right thing is now a special martingale. Funny thing is also that I can give you this martingale um, explicitly. Yeah. So putting the things together, we have now a nice interval for the Bermudan option price. I would like to repeat a few foundations. Yeah, so I hope you know all this stuff you know, which which I need. First definition is that of a super martingale. So a stochastic process X yeah, associated with the filtration F yeah, is called a super martingale. If X at the earlier time is larger or equal the expectation of X at a later time. So martingale prop uh, property would be X of S is equal expectation X of T conditional FS. And here it is X of S is larger or equal than the expectation. Yeah? So super martingale is related to our problem if you think of the backward algorithm yeah so our backward algorithm starts at the end yeah and then it takes conditional expectation and then it takes maximum of that value and the underlying so it increases a little bit yeah so if you can do an, a better exercise, it increases a little bit the value. And then it takes conditional expectation. And then again, maximum of this and the underlying. So it increases uh, again a bit 
the value. So this stochastic process that we were constructing in the backward algorithm is actually a super martingale. Yeah? We are doing conditional expectation always, the martingale property, yeah, but we interleave it, we interweave it with taking the maximum with some underlines, yeah, so it will increase. So that concept is important. Then the concept of a stopping time. So a stopping time is a stochastic time. Uh, I look only here at the time discrete case because I'm looking at Bermuden option. You can also reformulate all this in time continuous uh, form. Then you would consider American options, but actually also in in yeah in the industry and in application American option is often just a daily Bermuden option, something like that. Um, so let's formulate it in discrete time. Yeah, so then I have a stochastic time that can map from our set of sample paths omega to a set of times ti. And this is called a stopping time if the set t equals ti is fti measurable. So this just means, yeah, FTI is the information you have at time TI. So this just means uh, you know at time TI if you should stop or not, or if you have stopped or not. Yeah, this is exactly what we have in our Bermudan option. We base our decision on FTI random variables, on FTI observations. Yeah, The value of the underlying FTI measurable compared to the FTI conditional expectation of continuation. You can also reformulate this equivalently that T less or equal TI should be FTI measurable. Yeah? So we know if we have stopped on or before time TI. So the stopping time is the concept that encodes our admissible exercise strategy. Yeah, So the way we are allowed to exercise, it's not allowed to stop based on information that is available in the future. You know, that would generate foresight bias or foresight in the, in the evaluation. So a stopping time is actually then our mathematical representation of the exercise strategy of our Bermuden option. So we know uh, if we have stopped. And this condition, so this condition here, that we have a stopping time, this excludes our foresight bias. Okay, so given now this stuff, you can reformulate the Bermuden option valuation as taking, say, the maximum over all stopping times of the process that take, gives you the underlying values at the corresponding exercise times evaluated at a stopping time. Associated with this is the stop process. So what we actually then construct in the backward algorithm is a stopped uh, process. So maybe you recall this picture where I construct this random variable. Okay, so the stop process is not so important now for my derivation. More important is the Snell envelope. So actually the thing that we have constructed with the backward algorithm, yeah, I didn't introduce that name at that time yeah, because it was maybe not so relevant, but this thing also has a name. This process that we construct if we go backward, okay, and then always take conditional expectation and then the maximum with some underlying, and then again, conditional expectation of the maximum with some underlying. This is the Snell envelope of the stochastic process of the underlines. So the Snell envelope is this process U, you know, which we define here in this way. This is the Snell envelope of a time discrete process set. So we initialize 
at the end with z of gn. And then we always take the maximum of that z and the co conditional expectation of u ti plus one conditional f ti, and that defines now the u at ti. So this is called the Snell envelope of the process z. And in our application, the time discrete stochastic process z, so z of ti, this is the value of the underlying which we get if we exercise in time ti. So if we would write it in numerea relative values, because this is the formulation we use, this is the underlying, and sometimes I also added here an i, underlying i of ti divided by n of ti. So if this is the case, then the u of ti is actually my Bermudan option value. Also say numerea relative. Yeah, also this thing is called uh, the Snell envelope. And the Snell envelope is a super martingale. Yeah? As I explained, doing the backward algorithm, we construct a super martingale. Actually, it is the smallest super martingale that dominates Z. Yeah? So not only do we have the martingale property hidden a little bit here, yeah? and we take the maximum of that martingale and the Z. Yeah? We could also say we take Z, yeah, and then we take the maximum of Z and something that could be larger. Yeah? So we are dominating Z. So you see, since we have the maximum of Z here always, yeah, we are dominating the Z. And then this is the smallest super martingale that dominates Z. Yeah? Yeah, and now comes an important ingredient, and we are almost there in constructing our upper bound. Not yet visible. It's the Dupmeier decomposition, which we can do for a super martingale. So let you now denote our super martingale. Recall in our application that is the Bermudan option value in the backward algorithm. And then there exists a unique decomposition of our super martingale u into a martingale m and a previsible non-decreasing process a. So non-decreasing means I have that a of ti minus one is less or equal a of ti. The previsible, okay, that means, well, the in this time discrete uh, version here, it just means that A of Ti is actually Fti minus one measurable. Yeah? So we know it a little bit uh, advance, in advance. I can give these two guys yeah, the decomposition explicitly. My M, is given by m of ti is m of ti minus one plus ui minus expectation, conditional expectation of ui, conditional f ti minus one. You immediately see that this results in m being a martingale. Yeah? If you take m of ti, conditional expectation f ti minus one, yeah, then if you plug this in, you see that this is m of ti minus one plus conditional expectation ui minus conditional expectation, yeah, so plus zero. Yeah? So I have a martingale. And you also see that the process A, which I give you here, is non-decreasing, dec decreasing, because this looks like the martingale property, condition expectation ui minus ui minus one. And I have that my ui is a super martingale. 
Yeah, so we get this property of being non-decreasing from this. And now if you take the difference of the two, so here is the difference of the two. Yeah, if I take the difference of the two, then you see m minus a at ti is m minus a at ti minus one. This here cancels. So plus ui minus ui minus one. So taking now the sum of all those, yeah, those are the increments. Yeah, the increments for m minus a is equal to the increment for u. Huh? If you take the sum over the, these and initialize the a to zero and the m to the initial value of the u, you see that u is equal to m minus a. So we have a nice uh, decomposition of this super martingale into a martingale. And yeah, this uh, process A, yeah, which uh, is non-decreasing. Okay, so since I take here the minus, yeah, this means actually if I can then go forward in type, I'm I'm decreasing in the expectations and preversible. So another ingredient I need, and then we are done, is if you have a martingale, yeah, if you have a martingale then you have the property. So let M be a martingale. Yeah, if you have a martingale, then you have a property that the expectation of M, say at some time TJ, conditional to F T zero. Yeah, from the martingale property, property, this is m t0. And now the question is, what happens if you replace this fixed time in your conditional expectation with the stochastic time? Yeah? So say our stopping time. So if, if the capital T would not be a stopping time, you could say increase the value. Yeah. So, for example, if you have a sample path and say, you know, this sample path goes like that and then it goes up and this other sample path goes like that and it's go down. Yeah. And you have the martingale property that, uh, say, the um, expectation of these two values here corresponds then to this value here, if you would not choose a stopping time, these are these two sample paths are the same at this time. If you would not choose a stopping time, that is, you can look into the future, you can destroy this martingale property, you can increase the value by, say, for example, choosing that point here on that sample path, but that point here on that sample path. So you generate a bias high by choosing preferring sample paths that go higher uh, uh, in, 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 in the future. The thing is, if you plug in a stopping time, that won't happen. So I have the optional sampling theorem. I can plug in here a stopping time t, and I still have the property that expectation of a martingale evaluated on that stopping time is uh, conditional expectation ft0 is the martingale in tcr. Okay, so I need this now later. And now comes the dual formulation of my uh, Bermudan option valuation. First, so next slide is the dual formulation. First, let's just recall how our Bermudan option valuation looks when I reformulate it as an optimal stopping problem. So this is just repetition. So I have the exercise times given. My underlying is denoted here by V underlying at TI. So this is what I get if I exercise. This should be a sequence of FTI measurable random variables. So these are already the values that I get. And then I define recursively my Bermuden option value. So the Bermuden option value 
at the time ti is just maximized between receiving the underlying at time ti or the conditional expectation of the per Newton option value if you don't exercise so at the next time. We also recalled that or also uh, uh, we also noted that the formulation is much easier if you formulate everything relative to the numeraire. Yeah, so we get rid a little bit of this here. If we divide all the values by the numeraire, and now let's shorten a little bit notation. So V tilde U is the time discrete stochastic process of the underlying, and V tilde B is the time discrete process of my Bermudan option value going backward in the backward algorithm, backward in time. Actually, we are interested in V tilde B of T0. Yeah? So what is the value now? And my optimal exercise strategy in this formulation then looks very nice. So V tilde B of Ti is maximized between your underlying V tilde U of Ti and the conditional expectation of V tilde B at Ti plus one. So this is that we construct the Snell envelope. I have the dual formulation also for an American option. So for the American option, I'm actually looking at a time continuous version here. So T is a time continuous stopping time. Let's maybe skip this and go to the time discrete version. In the computer, we will also anyway implement it in a time discrete form. And yeah, here is the theorem. So let V tilde B be my Snell envelope my Bermudan option valuation by maximizing between the underlying and the condition expectation. And we are actually interested in what is the Bermudan option value in T0. Then this Bermudan option value in T0 is take the infimum over all martingales M. So martingales M that have initial value zero. So I start with a martingale with initial value zero over the expectation, take the maximum of the underlying value minus the martingale value evaluated at ti. Okay, so first important observation, this here, these are the times ti, so this is not the stopping time. So this is I maximize over all possible exercise times. So this includes foresight. So I really look along the sample path and check every time what is the value of the underlying. And if you forget for uh, for a second about this martingale, yeah, say it is zero, then this is the maximum foresight value. You look at what is the value of, of the underlying at every time and you take the maximum. So you maximize over the future. So note, what we have written there, this has to be understood passwise. So it's really passwise, and we maximize here over all, for a given sample path, omega, we maximize over time. So if you would like to have a small picture, what I'm doing there is you have a sample path, say, of your underlying underlying values, okay, maybe like this, or another sample path going like that, or another sample path going like that. Okay, and on every single sample path, you choose 
the maximum value that you get. So that value here on this sample pass, you would choose that value. On this sample pass, you would choose that value. If, for example, there's a sample pass that goes the same way like that one, and then it goes a little bit up again, you would choose this value, which is not admissible, which is forbidden because you use information about the future. Yeah, So the sample pass is deviating here at this point, and you decide on one guy that you choose that point because you know the future will go down. You ch choose on the other pa uh, pass to continue and choose a later, a later value. Also note, there's no conditional expectation involved in this expression here. Yeah? I just go through my Monte Carlo simulation and I, maximo, I maximize over all those sample paths. So if this martingale here would not be there, this is actually the perfect foresight value that we are generating. Yeah? Look at every sample pass and take, take out the maximum. And now the claim is that if you take the smallest value that you create by this strategy, where you subtract a martingale from the value of the underlines, this is the Bermudan option value. So we are coming from above, from the perfect foresight values, and we are taking the infimum. And clearly this gives me now an upper bound strategy because you can just forget about the infimum and take any martingale and you know the value that you construct in this way is an upper bound. Of course, you already know that the perfect foresight value is an upper bound. So the claim is a little bit that this martingale allows to remove the foresight. So taking the infimum over these martingales. The funny thing is I can give you the martingale explicitly that does this. Yeah, so we can construct it. So it's not that we have to yeah, try many different martingales. I know the martingale that removes this foresight bias. Yeah, so this is just what I said. This gives us an upper bound if we just choose any martingale. Yeah, so choose just a martingale. Martingale with initial value zero. So you see the constraints here to the martingale. This is just the martingale property. And so the important constraint is the martingale should have initial value zero. So just use any martingale with initial value zero and plug it in and maximize over all exercise times pathwise. This gives me then um, an upper bound. Other, other remark that I made is that this martingale removes our uh, foresight, foresight error. Okay, so here is the lemma that there is a martingale that removes the foresight error completely. So what does this mean? So this means if you do this actually evil thing that you maximize your underlying minus the martingale over all exercise times pathwise, then if you choose the right martingale, this corresponds to taking the optimal stopping time in this expression. Okay, and then if you now apply the expectation to the left and the right. So let's say you have expectation here of that. So on the left side, this is my claim, what I'm, what I'm doing. I take expectation of maximizing over all those times. On the right side, you have actually expectation of the underlying evaluated at the stopping time. So this guy, will become our Bermudan option value. And then I have expectation of a martingale evaluated at the stopping time. Then we can use the optimal sampling theorem that for a martingale evaluated at the stopping time, the martingale property is in 
that sense preserved. So the condition expectation is m of t0. However, my martingale had initial value zero. So you see that this expectation will become zero. So you see that on the right-hand side, I now just have the expectation of the underlying evaluated at the optimal stopping time, which is the Bermudan option value in, in, in zero. So I get, I get this. And here in the lemma, there's no infimum because I can explicitly state how the martingale looks like. So let's our underlying and the Bermudan option backward algorithm value be as before. So I maximize over the underlying and the conditional expectation of the Bermudan option value. And then the martingale M is the M from the Dupe Meyer decomposition of our Bermudan option value of our Snell envelope V tilde B. Okay, so how was that? So this was this guy. So M at the I is M at the earlier time plus UI minus conditional expectation of UI. So this is exactly what we have here. M at the I is M at the I minus one. And this is here our UI and the conditional expectation of the UI. So this is the M from the Dupe Meyer decomposition. And the claim is that this M does it. So, and now comes an interesting thing. To construct the M, you need an estimate for the conditional expectation. So conditional expectation has not vanished. Yeah. Also in the optimal stopping time in the capital T, it was contained because to construct the optimal stopping time, we have to compare underlying with conditional expectation. Yeah. We have to look at the exercise criteria. So there was the conditional expectation hidden. And here it is also hidden. But you could use our regression method, maybe, for this uh, conditional expectation. You have to be careful. You have to ensure that M stays a martingale. Yeah, but maybe we can we can do this. So let's prove this result that if I use this M, then yeah, we get that this M removes the foresight bias. So maximizing over all exercise times, V underlying minus M is actually then equal to uh, the optimal, uh, the V underlying minus M at the optimal stopping time. Okay, so I give the proof now using our definition of the Snell envelope and our definition of the Martingale. And first make a few observations. If I am before the optimal exercise time, so you know I go backward. Uh, if I am before, that means that before that time, it was not optimal to exercise. So this means that the Bermudan option value will not be increased by another application of the maximum operator. So the values that you observe in VB stay on the continuation value. So you will not exercise earlier. So this means the VB, the Bermudan option at a time TJ earlier no, is equal to the conditional expectation of the VB TJ plus one. So we will have continuation. 
in our backward algorithm. If we are on the optimal exercise time, then our VB is equal to the underlying because that's the definition we exercise into the underlying. So this is exercise. With our definition of the Snell envelope, so here this 559, yeah, so this is here our definition that we apply the maximum if we go backward. We have that the Bermudan option value at an earlier time is always larger or equal the conditional expectation of the Bermudan option at a later time because we are applying conditional expectation and then it can happen that we apply the maximum, yeah, okay, large or equal. This holds for all times. Yeah? This is just the, the backward algorithm that does this for us. Yeah, and we take the maximum of the future conditional expectation and the underlying. So the V B, yeah, the Bermudan option value constructed in the backward algorithm is, of course, also greater than the underlying for all times. So I need these yeah, four little ingredients now. And now just compare the V underlying minus our martingale. So compare this guy at the optimal exercise time, TI. So this here is the guy observed on optimal exercise time. So compare this value to the value of the underlying minus the martingale, so our expression, at any time. So this is any other time. And this is the first case, tj before the optimal exercise time. I also have the second case, tj after the optimal exercise time. Okay, so let's compare it now to some other time tj. And if I want to prove my claim, I have to show that V minus M at TJ is less or equal V minus M at the optimal exercise time, because then I can maximize over all the times before and after. I can maximize over all these times and the maximum is attained at the optimal exercise time. Yeah, let's check. So first I have that V minus M is equal to, uh, sorry, first I have that V tilde U, so for the underlying minus M is equal V tilde B minus M if I am on the optimal exercise. This is just because I have exercise. Okay, note that I am observing these guys here at the optimal exercise time. This was my number 62 on the previous slide here. Huh? So I'm on exercise. So I can move from the underlying at exercise time to the process of the Bermudans. Now, if you are in TJ plus one, so or some time later than TJ, so the TJ plus one could be the TI or no, it's just the next time. Then you have that the value of the Bermuden minus the M at the time TJ plus one is equal to the value of the Bermuden minus M at the time TJ. So if you go now from say TI forward, yeah, the value stays stays the same. Why is this the case? Okay, plug in the definition of the M. The definition of the M is that I can replace, oops, 
Oh, maybe take this. Replace the m of tj plus 1 with the m of tj. And then, yeah, plus the vb at tj plus 1 minus the condition expectation of that. Okay, there's a minus, so the signs flip. So this is just the definition of the m that we get. And then you see that this guy cancels. The VB at TJ plus one cancels. So the M moves to one step earlier. And in return, I get, you know, instead of the VB TJ plus one, I get the conditional expectation. But then I am before optimal exercise. So I can now use the 61. And I know that condition expectation of the later point is the value at the earlier time because I'm before optimal exercise. So I can replace this plus conditional expectation of the V, P, T, J plus one with this guy. So I have moved one step before, and you see that for V, B minus M, they stay the same. And then I can use 64 if I have now reached my time at which I would like to compare the guys. Yeah, so I have reached the time TJ. I use now the 64. So I'm going backward with always applying the maximum. So I can actually replace this guy, the VB, with the underlying. And yeah, I'm creating a smaller value. So if I now apply the 64, yeah, this means that VB is larger or equal than the underlying, yeah, because the VB is maximizing. So you know, you, if you plug this uh, together, yeah, this is actually starting here on the right hand side. If we plug this all together, we arrive, oops, we arrive on the left hand side that V u minus m at earlier times is always less or equal than v u minus m at the optimal exercise time. Okay, so maybe for the earlier times it's intuitive, I don't know. How does it look for the times tj being larger than ti? So now I would like to take times tj being larger than ti, and I would like to compare it to ti, being the optimal exercise time on that sample pass. So taking VU minus M at the optimal exercise time, plug in the definition of the M. So the definition of the M is now used in the other direction, yeah? So actually the definition of the M would be M of TI plus one is equal to M of TI the earlier point, yeah, so I go forward in time, plus the u minus the condition expectation. And now I go in the other direction. m of ti is m of ti plus 1. And then yeah, you move the u to the other side. It's actually a minus u plus condition expectation. But since I have a minus in front here, it becomes a plus the V tilde B of TI plus one minus the condition expectation. So I just apply the definition of the M in the other direction. So I would like to move from optimal exercise time to a later time and compare it. So then you can use 63. So 63 is the VB is larger or equal at an earlier time compared to the conditional expectation of a later time because I go backward and I maximize. So I can replace this conditional expectation here at the later time with the VB at the earlier time. This guy here is actually larger than that guy. But since I have used the M in the other direction, I have a minus in front 
I make the whole stuff smaller. So next step is to compare the underlying at TI with the VB, the Bermuden process at TI. Yeah, because I would like to move away from TI, I would like to move to the later time, TI plus one. And we have from 64, uh, which for going backward, yeah, that we maximize yeah, that this year is larger than the underlying because we maximize. Since there's the minus in front, we make it smaller if we replace it with the VB. Okay, so if we move yeah, to the TI plus one, um, we move from the VU to the VB, but then we make everything smaller, yeah, because we go in the opposite direction of the backward algorithm, yeah, make it smaller. Now I am on the VB uh, for a time TJ, yeah, and this is also with the 64, yeah, which is our, that we maximize. This is larger or equal. VB minus M is larger or equal VU minus M. So I'm M. If I plug this together at VU at the time TJ minus M at the time TJ. So I also have this now four times after the optimal exercise, if I use this special martingale, yeah, so with this difference of the conditional expectations, actually I'm removing the foresight and the maximum is attained at the optimal exercise time. So for all the guys, we have that VU minus M at optimal exercise time, TI, is larger or equal VU minus M at any other time. So that also then holds if you take here the maximum of all times TJ around this. Yeah, so doing um, perfect foresight. And this is a very, very nice trick. And now we have an, an upper bound. So the lemma shows that the Martingale M elements the foresight bias. Yeah, note that we have this property V minus M is at the optimal exercise time larger than at any other time. But this property of course does not hold if you use the Martingale to be zero. It is also an admissible M because this is then actually doing perfect foresight. So now I do the step that yeah, I have mentioned on the previous slide. So here, so let's apply now expectation, unconditional expectation on both sides. Okay, then on the left side, we take the unconditional expectation. Oops. We take the unconditional expectation of the value process of the underlines in which we exercise evaluated on our optimal stopping time. So this is the formulation where we would maybe intuitively maximize over all stopping times. So this here is our Bermuda option value in T0. This is what I would like to calculate. And I can do this by take the underlying value process minus that martingale and now maximize, so do perfect foresight over all, all uh, times and take from that the unconditional expectation. Yeah, also, a yeah, very nice mm, algorithm. Yeah. Okay, so the ingredients is that we have our number 140. So this is, if I take the expectation of the martingale on a stopping time, then this is just the martingale at 
the initial value and which we choose to be zero. So note expectation of M at the optimal stopping time or any stopping time, this is zero. So going from here to there, yeah, you can actually just drop, drop this. So now I can create a backward algorithm for the upper bound. Yeah? So I use this technique, but still, of course, I have to do a backward algorithm. I have to construct my VB or my VU minus M. Yeah? I have to construct this. So the backward algorithm for the upper bound now looks like that. Well, the process that I'm constructing is maximize V underlying minus M. So this is what I would like to do. I would like to maximize over all exercise times the V underlying i of ti, say the v tilde, everything divided by the normal area, minus the m of ti. I would like to construct this random variable. And from that random variable, I would like to take the unconditional expectation there. So I maximize by going also backward. Huh? I mean, you could also go forward now, but by going backward, so it looks like a backward algorithm. The V underlying at time Ti plus one, this is zero, yeah? because my Bermudan option in the end, yeah, you don't exercise, this is zero. So I initialize now my V, actually I believe it's the typo, it's a minus M, right? I will initialize that with a minus M. Okay. So then, yeah, that's the last point. Zero minus M, I maximize over these guys. Then I go backward and I just check if the V underlying at time Ti minus M is larger than the value at the later time. Yeah? Then I take the V underlying minus m, otherwise I retain it. So this ui here is just to calculating the maximum. So in the end, in the end, I will arrive at a u1. And this u1 is then that I have maximized over all these guys. And then I take the unconditional expectation of this random variable u1. Okay, so I have rewritten this maximization here with a backward algorithm. So, okay, I had could also could go forward. I really don't know uh, backward because I do perfect foresight. But there is a funny thing now. If you now compare this backward algorithm to the backward algorithm that we did for the lower bound, there are just two small changes. The first change is that we replace our V underlying, which is here, with V underlying minus M. And the second change is that we don't compare the V underlying or the V underlying minus M with the condition expectation. We compare it with the continuation value doing perfect foresight. So this backward algorithm looks very similar. Yeah? You replace the condition expectation operator there with just the value. So you use perfect foresight, but you use the M to adjust the underlying values to remove the foresight error. And the M contains the condition expectation operator. Okay, so very nice. Compare this backward algorithm to the one that we discussed yeah, before for the lower bound method, there are just two small changes. The 
Martingale M is subtracted from the underlying, which removes the foresight bias, and the conditional expectation operator is actually replaced with just the underlying, you know, which would create uh, the foresight bias. So this is a super optimal exercise strategy if we have foresight, yeah, that it's super optimal, we have some knowledge about the future. Um, and it is hence an upper bound yeah, if we do not use the correct Martingale M. In the script, you also find now just an example for a Bermudan stock option. Yeah, maybe we skip this. And that was the upper bound method. So here are a few references and that was it for today. Thank you.